Today we're going to talk about electromagnetic energy. When we talk about electromagnetic energy, the first thing that I want to just mention is that I've referred to this in a couple different ways before, and they're all equivalent. So electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic energy. Those three terms are all synonymous. They mean the same thing. So, what do we mean by electromagnetic energy? Well, before we get into exactly what it is, let's talk about the different types. We've already mentioned that electromagnetic radiation uh, comes in different types. Radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible ultraviolet, x-rays, which of course is what we care about the most, and gamma rays. And collectively, these different types of electromagnetic radiation are referred to as the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. And we'll talk more about the electromagnetic spectrum uh, in a few minutes. So what we'd like to understand in this chapter is what are the properties of electromagnetic energy? And what is it that differentiates one type from another. So for example, when we say that x-rays and visible light are both examples of electromagnetic energy, what is it that makes them different from each other? So in some way they're the same because they're both electromagnetic energy, but in some way they've got to be different because we know that an x-ray is going to go right through your skin and visible light is just going to bounce off your skin. Okay, so what is this stuff called electromagnetic energy? Well, electric mag electromagnetic energy, as you can probably guess from the name, is made up of electric and magnetic energy of some sort. And we say it's made up of electric and magnetic fields. A field is kind of a hard concept to understand, but if you think about, um, let's say I've got two magnets. So here's a North Pole and a South Pole and here's another North Pole and a South Pole. And you all know what's going to happen if I bring those two magnets together. They're going to repel each other. And one of the interesting things is somehow they interact with each other without touching, right? I can bring two magnets close to each other and you'll feel that repulsion, but they're not actually touching. And so somehow these magnets must be communicating with each other so that they know the other magnet is there and they know to repel. And that's something that's invisible, um, but that's what we call a magnetic field. And the same thing is true if we have two charges. We know, for example, a positive and a negative charge would attract each, be attracted to each other, or two positive charges would be repelled from each other. Well, how do they know that the other one wants to attract or repel it? Well, again, what we envision is that there is an electric field between them. So electric and magnetic fields basically communicate the electric and magnetic forces. And it turns out that electromagnetic energy is made up of electric and magnetic fields. One of the other things that uh, that is true about electromagnetic energy is that it travels in waves. And you, you can picture what a wave looks like on the water. Um, so you picture these ripples that are traveling along. And it turns out that electromagnetic energy travels in much the same way. And so one of the things that we'll be talking about in this chapter is about, about waves. One of the interesting things about electromagnetic energy is that it always travels at the same velocity whether it's a radio wave or an x-ray or, or visible light, they all travel at exactly the same speed and that speed is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Now normally we've been using the letter V to represent velocity but because the speed of light or the speed of electromagnetic energy is always the same, it's a constant, we use the letter C to represent the velocity of electromagnetic energy. So it's always 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. We've talked about the fact that matter is made up of discrete particles called atoms. And of course we know that atoms are 
further made up of electrons, protons, and neutrons. When you look at uh, any of the objects around you, they all look continuous. They don't look like they're really made up of individual particles, and that's just because those particles, atoms, are so small. The same thing can be true, can, uh, the same thing is true of electromagnetic energy. Electromagnetic energy actually comes in very small bundles of energy, which we call photons. And uh, these are sometimes called quantum, which simply means a small amount of something. Okay, so photons are little bundles of energy that make up electromagnetic energy. Now, photons are different than matter, different from atoms and protons and neutrons and electrons in a couple important ways. Um, photons are pure energy. They have no mass, so they're not particulate. They are just pure energy. And you might remember that in a previous chapter we differentiated between alpha and beta radiation, which were particulate radiation because that was helium, a helium nuclei or an electron, and gamma radiation, which was just pure uh, electromagnetic radiation. So photons are massless, it's pure energy. Photons also have no electric charge, they're neutral. So we now want to talk about waves, since electromagnetic energy travels in waves. And it turns out that, in general, vibrations create waves. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is what do we mean by a vibration? Well, a vibration, or something that's vibrating, is simply something that's shaking back and forth. So one thing you can imagine is if I took a mass and I hung it from a spring and I pulled that mass down, we all know what would happen. That mass would oscillate or vibrate up and down. That would be example of, an example of a vibration. Another example is a tuning fork. And probably at some point you've seen a tuning fork or even played around with a tuning fork where you hit it and then it rings, uh, it gives off a particular sound. That's because the tines of the tuning fork are simply vibrating back and forth with a certain frequency. Okay, so what is the unit that we use for frequency? Well, since frequency is the number of vibrations per second, the traditional unit for that was cycles per second, meaning how many back and forth motions per second. So if the tuning fork goes over to here and then back to here, that would be one vibration or one cycle. And so how many cycles per second does it go through? Um, we now use the unit called the Hertz. That's in honor of uh, the physicist Frank Hertz who actually came up with uh, or really discovered radio waves. So a hertz simply means a cycle per second or a vibration per second. So if we have a tuning fork and we hit it, it's oscillating or vibrating at a certain number of cycles per second. Let's say that we have a tuning fork that oscillates at 440 hertz. What that does is it moves the air molecules around the tuning fork and it actually produces a sound wave. And if you think about that sound wave, it then travels throughout the room you're in, including getting to your eardrum and making your eardrum vibrate at 440 hertz. And that's how your brain then interprets that it's heard a sound of a certain pitch. Okay? So vib something that's vibrating will create a sound wave. Uh, when you make a vibration in water, it creates a water wave. Let's take a look at what a wave is. So a, a wave is simply a vibration that moves through space. And one of the ways to, to picture this is with a slinky. And I'll actually do this demonstration with you in class. But uh, if you take a slinky and just stretch it across the floor, if you then take one end of the slinky and start shaking it back and forth, side to side, what will happen is a wave will be created on the slinky. And that wave will travel down the slinky. So it would look something like this. So a vibration creates that wave that then travels down the slinky. If you looked at any point on the slinky 
as the wave goes by, you'll see that that point is just oscillating back and forth, just like the end of the slinky where I created the wave. So that frequency continues throughout the whole wave. Sometimes we refer to a wave that looks like this as a sinusoidal wave or sine wave. And that's simply because it looks just like a mathematical function called the sine. And if you remember at some point in your past taking a trigonometry course, you probably had to learn about sines and cosines and tangents. Um, we certainly don't need to remember that stuff in any detail for this course, but I'll just remind you that if you plot um, the sine function, it looks like that. And so if we wanted to mathematically describe this wave, we could do it with a sine function. And we're not going to get into that deep level of detail, but that's why it's called a sine wave or sinusoidal wave. Okay, so let's look at what are the properties that make one wave different from another. One of the properties we've already talked about is frequency. Okay, so the frequency that created the wave. Um, another thing is the wavelength. And if I draw a, a wavelength here, the wavelength is simply the distance between adjacent crests or adjacent troughs. And in fact, it's really just the distance between any two identical points on the wave. So that would also be the wavelength. Okay. And I always think of wavelength, it's kind of like the repeat pattern of wallpaper. If you look at wallpaper, every few feet the wallpaper repeats, so that if you look along the wallpaper on the wall, all of a sudden you get to something identical to what you saw just a few feet back in the other direction. So that's really what wavelength is. It's just the repeat distance of the wave. When we talk about wavelength, um, we use a symbol to represent it. And that is the symbol, and that is the Greek letter lambda. So lambda is the symbol that we use to represent wavelength. OK, so we've looked at frequency and wavelength it has two properties of a wave. Another important property of a wave is the amplitude. And the amplitude of a wave simply is how big it is. Okay? So for example, when I shake the slinky, if I shake it just a little bit side to side, it's going to have a small amplitude. If I shake it very, in a very large way side to side, it's going to have a large amplitude. So the amplitude is the distance from the midpoint of the wave to the top of the crest, or from the midpoint of the wave down to the trough. So let's look at what an electromagnetic wave might look like. So basically, when an electromagnetic wave is traveling in this direction, what it consists of is electric fields and magnetic fields oscillating perpendicular to each other and perpendicular to the direction of motion. So obviously this is very hard to kind of visualize, but basically what we have, if you're being hit by visible light hitting you, you're being hit by these oscillating electric and magnetic fields. One of the interesting things about electromagnetic waves, as opposed, as opposed to other types of waves, waves like sound waves or water waves, is um, no medium is needed. And what I mean by that is that an electromagnetic wave can travel even through the vacuum of space, whereas a sound wave needs air to travel in. Um, and sound can't travel through a vacuum. So electromagnetic waves are unique. They can, they can travel even when there's nothing else there, when there's no air to travel through. Now, we said that waves like sound waves are created by a vibration. You wonder, may wonder, what's vibrating that creates an electromagnetic wave? And basically, all electromagnetic waves are created in some way or another by vibrating electric charges. And there are different ways that electromagnetic waves can be created depending on which type of electromagnetic radiation it is that we're talking about. So for example, in radio waves, um, you can probably picture a big radio antenna um, you know, outside a radio station. 
literally what's happening with radio waves is that electrons are vibrating up and down the antenna and those vibrating electrons up and down the antenna create the electromagnetic wave just like me vibrating my hand back and forth creates that wave traveling down the slinky. Um, for visible light waves and for x-rays it's a little bit different. Um, one way that visible light can be uh, created is inside an atom. So here's our nucleus of the atom and let me just draw a couple electron shells here. When an electron jumps down from one shell to another, so if, if that atom is excited and the electron is in a higher shell than it normally is, when it jumps back down, it gets rid of that energy in the form of a photon. And so that can be visible light. If the electron is jumping down from a higher shell to a much lower shell, um, that can actually be an x-ray. And you'll talk about x-ray production later on, but basically the way x-rays are produced is that an inner electron is hit out of its orbit. And when, an, when one of the outer electrons jumps down to fill that hole, it has to give up energy because outer electrons have more energy, and it gives that up in the form of an x-ray. So electric charges and vibrations or changes in an atom um, of electric charges, such as electrons, that's how electromagnetic waves are produced.